I'm Al McFarland. Welcome to Conversations with Al McFarland. And you know, it's all about the neighborhood. This is a conversation about how we build our community, our neighborhood, house by house, family by family. We're focusing on business creation, business development, economic development, and culture. I'm Al McFarland. Welcome to Conversations with Al McFarland. Today we're presenting the program from the Minneapolis Urban League and we're glad to be here. We're glad to have you along, those who are watching on television and those listening on KFAI. Today's program is an important one. We're talking about health insurance for Minnesotans. We've got a new program called Minsure, and it's a product of the federal legislation for health care reform. I'm pleased to have to speak about that April Todd Mom Love, who is executive director of Minsure, joining us in this conversation, two pillars in the community, two advocates, two people who deliver value to the uh, health of our community. Stella Whitney West is CEO of North Point Health and Wellness, and Mitchell Davis is the intersection director of the Minneapolis Urban League. Uh, thank you all for being here. And uh, first of all, April Todd Malmloff, thank you for being here. Let's, let's begin by uh, sort of Minsure 101. What is it and what does it mean for Minnesota? It's a new idea, a novel idea, and a great opportunity, I believe, for many, many more Minnesotans to have health insurance. Absolutely, absolutely. Thank you for having me. It's great to be here. Um, so I think what you could say about Minsure is, um, and about exchanges generally, are, are four key things. Uh, one is that um, the purpose of Minsure is it's really a new marketplace to find health insurance. And um, the first key thing is that it's supposed to make things simpler and easier. I think we all understand that healthcare is way too complicated. Um, most people have a very hard time understanding it. There's a lot of terms that are very hard to understand. Um, and so really it's to make health insurance much easier for, for people to understand and for people to find coverage. Um, so it's one place for coverage regardless of the source or type. So it includes public programs, private coverage for individuals and small businesses. Number two, uh, the second purpose of Minsure is to make healthcare coverage more affordable. And that is really done in two ways. Uh, one is that it's a place where financial assistance that came under the Affordable Care Act will be available. So people will have access to um, tax credits to help them purchase insurance. Some people may also be eligible for free coverage, depending on what their income is. And then thirdly, it also provides a mechanism to encourage insurers to be more innovative and more competitive with each other. Um, so that's number two. Number three is it provides more freedom of choice of healthcare options. And so it's gonna provide people with information to help them make the choice that's best for them and their families. And so this is particularly of interest for small businesses, where in the past small businesses have typically picked one plan and their employees are all in one plan. This allows the employees to pick the plan that's best for them and taking that employer contribution to help them afford that coverage. And then fourthly, what I would say is that it also provides more assistance and localized assistance. It, it, it helps people where they're at. So if people want to go online to get that help, they can absolutely do that in the comfort of their home. If they want to use the phone and call and get, some, get help from someone um, over the phone, they can do that. And we'll also have people on the ground in local communities that can also help individual communities with the needs that they have. Um, and so those are really the four pillars of, of what Minsure is designed to do. The concept of exchange. Uh, some people may, may not be familiar with what an exchange means. So explain that. Why are we calling it an exchange? What does exchange mean? What does exchange do? Um, well, exchange actually isn't probably the best word that I would use. Um, actually, what I would call it is um, a simple shopping mall um, and an online shopping mall for people to find um, information. Um, I think the reason why it's called an exchange is that early in its development, it was kind of... Um, kind of referred to as a kind of stock exchange where people go to buy and sell products and information is readily available. So I think that's where the word exchange came from, but really it is, is it, it is meant to be a simple shopping mall for health insurance. And generally people are gonna be accessing the information online, correct? 
that is the goal, that we try to make this as simple as pop possible so that a person can do this on their own online. So what does it mean? Walk me through it. Uh, I'm uh, a person who lives around the corner here in North Minneapolis, and I uh, maybe had health insurance at my company, but they've cut back because of all kinds of reasons, but I still need insurance. Uh, I've been waiting for Obamacare to kick in because I think there should be something for me, but I don't know exactly what that should be. Walk me through the process. Walk you through the process. So um, there are a few things people can do. First, um, you can just go online and see what it is. So you can see what products are available. You can see what the price is. You can look and see um, information on customer satisfaction, on the quality of both the health plan and of the health care providers that are associated with that plan. So you can just shop and see what's available. That's one thing. You can also go and see what you might be eligible for. So you can enter in some personal information like your name and your address. Mm -hmm. um, and it can cross-check um, some information about your income, for example, to see if you might be eligible for um, tax credits or even free coverage. Um, to see what that would be. So you'll see what you're eligible for. And then based on those two sources of information, you can decide what's best for you. So do you want um, certain providers in your network? Do you want um, a certain cost um, to pay? Does Is premium more in, important to you? Or is cost sharing more important to you? Um, really, they can they can base that decision on what is, what is most important to them. Maybe in the past, uh, my family has been eligible for what was called Minnesota Care. Does that change? Am I still getting Minnesota Care, or is Minnesota Care the best solution for me? That is yet to be determined, um, and the reason for that is that that first, is tell them what Minnesota, Minnesota Care, Care is. First is of Minnesota all. Care. Yeah. Uh, so Minnesota Care uh, was created in Minnesota in the early 1990s, and essentially what it was is a, a premium support program um, where um, a person paid an, a premium based on their income for a certain set of benefits that they received. Um, under the Affordable Care Act, um, health insurance is changing for everyone. And so we're trying to decide in Minnesota if it makes sense to have Minnesota Care continue or not. There is an option where Minnesota Care could continue um, up to 200% of the federal poverty level, which is about 44000 for a family of four. Um, but right now it's at the legislature. And so um, that, that decision needs to be made at the legislature by the end of this May. And so we will know by then whether or not that continues um, as a program or whether or not people would be able to get tax credits to purchase private coverage at those income levels. When we listened to the president and the Congress debate uh, affordable health care, uh, the thought that kept coming uh, out was that this is going to require and uh, provide opportunity for everybody. It's 100 percent. How does that shake out in Minnesota, number one? Does Minsure uh, become the vehicle for universal coverage for every Minnesotan? That's question number one. And I've got five more after that, but start with that one. Start with that one. Well, I definitely think there's the opportunity there to get close with mm -hmm. that. Um, really, it is, Minsure is there for all individuals and small businesses. Um, but but we know that that probably won't reach everyone. I think you know the estimates that are there at the national level is that you'll probably reach 60% of the uninsured. There are still some out there that just won't have insurance and don't want to buy it, and there will be a variety of reasons for that. But, um, but I really think this gets gets us a long way there. Um, but it won't it won't reach probably won't reach everyone yet quite yet. So, so describe the uh, the landscape, the terrain for insurance and insurability in Minnesota. How does it look right now? If the goal is to reach 60%, if, mm -hmm. if the expectation is that 60% of Minnesotans will be insured, what's the current status? And uh, what would it take to get us to closer to 100%? Mm -hmm. So in Minnesota today, we have about 500,000 individuals that are uninsured. Our projections are that we'll get down to about 200,000 or less that are there. I think a few of the things that are changing that will help with that is one, the financial assistance that I mentioned. People will get financial assistance to purchase coverage. Hopefully it will also be much easier for people. Um, the application process will be much simpler. Today to get um, access to financial assistance often takes a couple of months with a lot of information to provide and, and often is, is quite daunting I think for people to do, so making it easier. Um, so so really it's it's there to to make choices easier, to make things more affordable for people, um, and, and to provide them the assistance that they need. One other thing that I'd mentioned too that is very different in the future than it is today is that people can't be denied for health insurance anymore. 
So today, based on your health status, insurers can deny you. Mm -hmm. um, they can no longer do that in the, in the future. They can't deny you based on your health status. They can't say you have a pre-existing health condition that we're not going to cover. They can't charge you more because you're sick. That all goes away. Mm -hmm. And so I think that will encourage people to, to, to come to the door and get insurance. And, and so explain then or describe uh, the uh, use of insurance in inner city communities. Uh, one of our missions today is to talk about Minsure and its impact or the opportunity it represents to African Americans and people of color. And if you would, give a, sort of a primer on what the state's experience has been in providing coverage or uh, of people of color getting coverage in Minnesota. Well, I think uh, Minnesota does have a lot of disparities in terms of um, health insurance coverage. Populations of color are, you know, two, three, four times less likely to have insurance. Mm -hmm. And I think, you know, one of the reasons to really have um, health insurance is that safety and security, to know that there's care there when you need it, um, and that you can get it wherever wherever you need it. Um, I think as well, there's also, um, to consider it from the small business perspective as well, is that, you know, if you have employees with health insurance, you have a much more healthy and productive workforce. And so this also provides small businesses more opportunities, makes it easier for them to have insurance. And I think when you have that, you have, again, more productive employees. Mm -hmm. um, that helps not only just someone's health, but also helps the health of communities as well. And so, um, you know, I think from a public health perspective, and some of my colleagues would probably agree with this as well, that if you can provide people safety and security, um, both in their jobs and in their health, um, that also helps just the health of the community generally. What's the general plan for getting people enrolled? Uh, when do you start getting people enrolled in Minsure? And how will you let people know that uh, the resource is available and uh, get them signed up? Okay. Um, a few different ways. And maybe I'll, I'll start from when open enrollment um, starts and walk backwards a bit. So open enrollment starts October 1st of 2013. Mm -hmm. And people can enroll during a six-month period from October through March of 2014. So there will be that open enrollment period. Prior to that, we will be opening a call center um, in September. So that will be open a month prior to, so people can call um, with any questions that they have. And then um, during the summer, there's a lot of work that we're going to be doing in getting the message out in a variety of ways. Um, one is through just standard marketing. So you'll start to see commercials and radio ads and billboards and, and those types of common things. Um, but we also will have what are called navigators and in-person assisters and brokers and agents that you use today that will also be trained in local communities to help those um, small businesses and individuals get information and help them start to get ready to, for open enrollment in October. Okay, great. Do uh, you see any barriers <clears throat> getting to the black community, uh, getting people to buy in, uh, to understand the value, and to embrace the opportunity? I think there, I think there is a lot of work to do there. I mm -hmm. think that the disparities that we do have in coverage, um, there's definitely um, some extra effort that we're going to have to put in um, to those communities, and we're we're really trying to, um, through our navigators and in-person assisters and, and brokers and agents, make sure that um, there are people in the community that have experience with those communities that are ready to serve and help people um, understand what is coming their way. Um, and I think we've we've tried to have a, a strong um, a strong sense to try to use Minsure to reduce health disparities. What is one of the key pieces that was mentioned in the legislation that it was passed, as it was passed, is that one of the key goals is to really reduce health disparities and, and make sure that we're, we're getting coverage to everyone. I'm Al McFarland. This is Conversations with Al McFarland. I'm talking with April Todd Malmlove. Mal I'll, I'll say it right. Uh, April, thank you for being here. April is the new executive director of Minsure. Uh, how is Minsure organized? What's the structure of that agency? Who do you report to? Uh, what's the governance uh, structure for Minsure? So Minsure is um, a state board. That's how the legislation was was um, enacted. And so Minsure will report to a board of directors. 
The board of directors has seven members. Um, six of them are appointed by the governor and uh, confirmed by the House and Senate. And one of them will be a standing member, which is the Commissioner of Human Services or our Medicaid agency. And so we will we should soon know who those uh, six members are. Um, Any day now, right? Uh, tomorrow, tomorrow, in fact, is, is okay. the deadline date um, for finding out who those six board additional board members are. How large an organization uh, is Minsure right now, and how large would it be when it's fully operational? Um, in, in, in terms of people, okay. number one, and also in terms of budget, what's the cost of uh, this enterprise? Uh, so people, in terms of actual bodies on the ground, mm -hmm. um, we are roughly 80 to 90 um, employees um, mm -hmm. that are projected to work at Minsure, and um, our budget ranges between 40 to $60 million, depending on enrollment. So mm -hmm. the more enrollment that we bring in, the more funding that we will need for customer service um, to make sure that we have people out there helping, um, providing assistance where it's needed. So that leads to the policy question, and it's a question I ask all my guests, and that's a question of engagement and inclusion. I'm interested in knowing what strategies you've begun with to ensure that uh, black people and people of color, people of color, are part of your organization, your workforce, uh, and that your business operation not only provides the goods and services, but provides extended, um, what's the right word for it, uh, collateral benefits for communities of color. Do you get the feeling of the question? I think so. So yes. how do you engage? What do you plan to do to make sure that the governor's vision of inclusion mm -hmm. is thoroughly and consistently available and clear and actionable in this organization? Okay. Well, I think uh, even before the legislation was passed, um, we started on a few of those things. And so uh, one of the first things was um, the creation of the Health Insurance Exchange Task Force, where we really tried to make sure we had broad participation throughout the state. Um, underneath that task force, we had um, well over 10 different technical working groups um, on a variety of really technical topics um, to bring in the assistance that, that we needed to get all perspectives on, on how Minsure should start to be developed. Um, there was also feedback coming in from those groups as well as to how the legislation should be drafted. So we really tried to start from the beginning to get all of those perspectives. Um, in addition, one of the other things in the legislation that is included is that we make sure that um, the board is advised um, by a series of, um, of advisory groups. And those advisory groups will be representing consumers and small businesses and, um, and industry. So we want to make sure that we have everyone's perspective included in that. Mm -hmm. And that has always been a strong commitment that we've had, and we definitely intend to make sure that we have that commitment into the future. Because if we're not getting those perspectives, we're not going to be successful. And then so April, uh, what's your background? How did you come to this position? What, what do you bring to the table? My background, uh, well, prior to coming into this position, I was a uh, Minnesota State Health Economist, um, served in that role. Prior to that, I worked at United Health Group, um, and I was in two separate positions. One of them was in competitive intelligence, and so essentially what that means is uh, understanding how health insurance works and how you make products competitive to compete with um, your competitors. And then I also um, was the Vice President of Communications and uh, Strategic Analysis for Government Affairs at Corporate United Health Group at that time, at the time that the ACA was getting passed. And so um, was involved in all of the, all the discussions and, and the nuances of, of when the ACA was going through its deliberation and passage. So did you envision yourself being where you are right now at some point earlier in your career uh, as the leader of this new initiative? I think there's there's nowhere else I'd want to be. Um, <laughs> this is a very fun time to um, to be in this line of work um, in healthcare. It's it's a time of great change and great opportunity. Mm -hmm. um, I think that we can do a lot of great things, and I would definitely not want to be anywhere else other than here. Well, thank you for being here. Let me broaden the conversation and bring in uh, two voices of. Uh, uh, people that I feel uh, and I call stewards of the health of our community. They're on the ground floor. Uh, they're trench fighters. Uh, they make health happen in our community every day, all day, and they do stellar work in projecting both the value and providing the service that uh, our communities desperately need and that they so aptly fill. Stella Whitney West is the CEO of North Point Health and Wellness. It's a, uh, an institution uh, in this community that uh, represents our will 
to serve ourselves and to serve ourselves with quality and with professionalism. Bill Tyndall is her counterpart from my point of view as the <laughs> leader of Southside Medical. They may not see themselves as counterparts, I don't know, but I see them as, as a, uh, parts of a three-legged stool. Uh, the two of them, one north, one south, and their partner, I call them their partner in St. Paul, mm -hmm. and it's Open Cities. Mm -hmm. But the three institutions really admirably uh, advocate and deliver value and service to our community. So I wanna ask you both to weigh in on the question of the uh, insurance exchange on Minsure. But first, start by uh, telling us about your organization, what North Point is doing to serve the health needs of our community and how the Minsure Affordable Health Care Act program is going to support what you do. Uh, Stella, let me start with you, and thank you for being here. Um, thank you, Al, for the uh, invitation and for this, um, I, I would say, just-in-time um, topic, talking about um, insurance in the uh, Minnesota Health Ex Exchange or the Minsure. Um, it was great to, to hear uh, April talk about um, uh, all of the uh, components of it. Um, I was uh, a part of the... Um, advisory task force and uh, served for a short period of time. I actually uh, assumed, uh, assumed the uh, tenure of Dory uh, Cabolo, who had passed away, and so the commissioner asked me if I would uh, come on to uh, the task force, and I was, I was glad to do it. So um, North Point, and, and most of you are aware of uh, North Point, uh, we are a community health center, a federally qualified health center. We've been in North Minneapolis. Uh, Plymouth and Penn, um, 45 years now, we'll be celebrating that. Uh, comprehensive clinic, we're the second largest uh, community clinic in the state of Minnesota. There are 17 across the state, so we have medical, dental, uh, behavior health, we have an on-site pharmacy, we also provide a, a number of uh, social services as well. The food shelf um, is probably our largest uh, social services program and many people are familiar with that. We also have a number of community health outreach programs. A couple of the members in the audience um, reminded me of Women of Distinction, which is a very distinguished group of elders who have been meeting at North Point for a number of years and meet monthly to um, talk about various health topics um, that relate to uh, seniors and really relate to the entire uh, community. So um, almost 85% of our patients are people of color. Uh, we have a patient base of about 23,000 patients on an annual basis. And um, about 30% of our patients are uninsured. And for us, that certainly means that having um, access for insurance uh, to a large segment of, of our community and our, of our patients is extremely uh, important. It's important uh, for a lot of the reasons that, that April talked about, um, that sense of security that, uh, that you know that you have uh, insurance and the, the fact that through the Affordable Care Act, you cannot be denied uh, insurance due to a pre-existing condition. And a number of, um, of procedures, uh, uh, prevention, um, now are being covered uh, through the Affordable Care Act. So we have certainly a much broader scope that is available uh, to, to our patients. I think um, making sure, and again, uh, Minnesota is on the, on the cutting edge, um, last time that I was checking, there are only 18 states, I believe, that are operating their own exchange. States had an opportunity to uh, submit a plan for their own exchange, or um, they would then, um, it would be the federal government then that would operate your exchange. And there's a couple of states, I think only a few, that are in a partnership. Um, with the exchange, and I think uh, Minnesota certainly stepped out early as a leader in pulling together all of the um, members of the community to develop this exchange. Now, as, as it is with anything new, um, 
coming out the door, there's going to be uh, problems. There's going to be opportunities where we're going to have to uh, tweak uh, this exchange. One of the things that we were concerned about was the fact that the seven-member governing board, and some people will say it's a good thing. Some of us think, well, mm, you kind of miss some folks. So there's a conflict of interest uh, on the governing board. So uh, members of that board cannot have um, any affiliation with health care. So uh, Bill and I, who, uh, as if you have said, uh, Al, are on the ground and in the community, we would not be eligible to serve on that board. So we would not be able to represent the voices of the communities. However, there is an opportunity on the advisory board. So we're looking forward to being able to, to do that. I would certainly advise members in the community, members of the, of the particularly the communities of color, uh, to watch this to make sure that your needs are being met. This is a great opportunity. It certainly will afford uh, access um, to care that uh, before, uh, particularly African Americans, did not have. So. Thank you, Stella Whitney West. Bill Tyndall, same question for you. If you would, uh, first of all, thank you for being here. Thank you for what you do mm -hmm. for South Minneapolis and for our Twin Cities. Mm -hmm. uh, but talk about uh, the value that Southside Medical provides to the community and what your expectation is, your hope, maybe your fears may be, uh, mm -hmm. that uh, uh, will be brought by uh, the Minsure program, the implementation of the Affordable Care Act. We're more than happy to. Thank you for having me here today, and also I'd like to Thank you, uh, I apologize for being a little late. Um, one of the things is Stella and I are both members of the, um, of, uh, the Minnesota Association of Community Health Centers, and we're also um, uh, fairly qualified health centers where we provide benefits for people who are uninsured and underinsured. And like Stella, we have um, not as many patients as she has, we're not as big, but we do provide a lot of the same services. We provide vision care, we provide um, um, dental care, medical care, but in probably if any of you have been out in any community events, you saw the community van, which is part of Southside, um, and they work in conjunction with Care 11. And we also have a mobile dental van that travels around basically locally around here. Southside's been around for 43 years, not as long as North Point. Um, we've served South Minneapolis for that whole period of time. And we were actually um, created by Vista Volunteers back in the 1970s. And the Vista Volunteers started on Lake Street and then they moved down to 4243 4th Avenue South, which is currently the same place that we house right now. We have probably about 70 employees. And one of the things that we've done based on the Affordable Care Act is that we've tried, started beefing up our staff to handle what we feel is going to be the big push in that. One is, is that we have an outreach department, so we have a community health worker who will be working with a care guide who works inside the clinic. And then we've also hired a referral coordinator um, who is gonna be dedicated to building relationships with specialists so that our patients um, can get specialty care whenever they need it. We see um, the Affordable Care Act as an opportunity, but at the same time, I'm kind of unclear about how this is all going to look. And um, I think a lot of other people are too. Maybe April might know more than I know. Um, but I see it as a great opportunity for healthcare for all communities. Um, it's doing a number of things that I think are needed. Um, one of the little things about that is I was looking at uh, one of the documents I have here is just trying to limit executive compensation who provides care to people who are uninsured and underinsured and, and people across the country. And that's a very important thing because a lot of times people take home million dollar salaries that probably would better um, serve the community, especially communities of people who just don't have any health care at all. So we hope that this would be a benefit for all of us. Let me ask you both to, to explain to your um, customers, uh, the people that you serve, how this process will affect whether they are a Minnesota care recipient or partner or member, or whether they use Blue Cross or Health Partners, uh, uh, UCARE, all the plans that are available. 
And uh, I think there may be a perception that if you are poor mm -hmm. or poorer, mm -hmm. you simply don't have the opportunity to use uh, what you may think are more quality services in the private marketplace. Whether that's true is another question, but that's a perception. Mm -hmm. So h how do you address people's concern? I think people want to get the best service they can get. And uh, how do you advise? What do you think? Well, I, I'm kind of unsure right now what Minnesota Care is going to look at look like. I think April might have a better idea than I do. My understanding is that Minnesota Care will be a program where people who don't make the exchange or don't, don't want to use the exchange would fall into that category. But I see most people being able to go into the exchange, especially people who don't have the money to, um, to afford health care. So like I said earlier, I'm a little bit unclear about how this is all going to shake out. And I think a lot of people are trying to build, we're going to be building it as we go, is what I think. I'm Al McFarland. This is Conversations with Al McFarland. Thank you all for listening and for watching. Let's bring another voice into the conversation, and I'll come back to you on that same question a little later, Stella Whitney West. But Mitchell Davis is a person who's experienced and knowledgeable about health care and health care policy. He is the intersection director for the Minneapolis Urban League. Uh, Mitchell, thank you for hosting us here today at the Urban League. Uh, and you started off uh, being focused on health as one of the major intersections for the delivery of services for this organization. But you came to the organization having served our state as the director of the Office of Minority Health. You've got a great uh, sort of bird's eye view of the health concerns of people of color uh, in Minnesota. How does this transition towards Minsure look from your point of view, uh, from having been uh, a leader at the state in developing policy, and now one of the people involved with creating structures and access at the ground level through the work of the Minneapolis Urban League. That's a loaded uh, question. It's I'll, a lot to answer. It is plenty, <laughs> but it's good to be here, and also that we're talking about Minsure today. Um, one of the key things about the Affordable Care Act, I'm going to talk there first, and then talk a little bit about the office that we used to do at the minor, with Minority Health. The interest of African Americans um, is critical, especially as we look at this health insurance. Um, I remember some of the statistics we would look at um, through the Minnesota Department of Health statistics of disparities, and everyone hears that word now, so it doesn't have much, as much impact as it, was, as it does many years ago. But one key thing is we know health disparities basically account. We know, I mean, you can look at any of the chronic diseases from diabetes to heart disease, stroke, et cetera, and we know that there's a huge gap between our majority population and our populations of color. And the Minsure, in which I'm really pleased to know and hear more about every single day, is we know it's gonna expand access to care. That's what we know that it's gonna end abuses of insurers. We know that uh, it, it's critical that health care is more affordable. It is very expensive uh, if you don't have insurance. And for many that are listening today, even if they do have insurance and you're on the private market that you have bought it yourself, it is extremely expensive. And then the fourth piece is that it creates jobs. This Minsure, these health exchanges are creating real well-paying jobs, and it's going to target health care benefits to the most vulnerable and those who are in need. Um, April talked about the online marketplace, uh, that uh, website, if you will. Uh, one of the key things, just as a community-based organization, the Minneapolis Urban League and many others, uh, that we know that Minnesotans will be able to find health care, they'll be able to compare it, they'll be able to choose and purchase health care coverage that best fits their family needs and their personal needs. So those, uh, those strong foundational points, those four, four pillars, if you will, will certainly provide a better avenue. But if you've started in the game, I, the way 
I used to run track in high school, and what I remember our coach would always say, I want you to be well seasoned, I want you to be well conditioned, and then I know that you'll do your very best out there. But just say that you're at that starting line, and you're ready to, everyone's in the blocks, and you're ready to take off, but instead of shooting that gun in the air, uh, one of us a hit in the knee with that bullet. And so when, and I'm, I'll say I'm the African American, so I'm hit in the knee with that. So I'm gonna be crippled right off the back as soon as the race starts off. The way I look at this is we have been crippled for a long time because when you look at the uninsurance rates, African Americans, Hispanics, American Indies, Indians in particular have much higher rates uh, than the majority population. And so now this is going to hopefully level some of the field, but there's of course more work to be done. Uh, there's access to care. There's, of course, we've talked about affordable care. We've also knowing that how do we make sure that our families, our friends, our grandparents, our aunts and our uncles uh, that don't have any care right now and don't have a clue about, well, how does this work? Where will they begin? So last year we held about four forums here at the Urban League to talk about here's how it will work. But of course that was quite a while ago. So we're interested, as Bill has said too, to see how will the more of these details shake out uh, in the very near future. October 1 is right upon us. Uh, the summer is going to be very, very packed because not only will individuals have to learn about it, um, how it works, how it does not work, but also there'll be quite a bit of training, I understand, too, for those insisters and also navigators who will want to be participants and partners of this. Of course, policy means to me, how do you, not only is there the law in place, but how, does, how do I actually access it and use it so that I can be in better health than when I don't have any insurance at all. You mentioned uh, one of the objectives would be to end abuses. What were we talking about? What were you referring to when you said this process might uh, help end abuses in the healthcare system or the healthcare insurance system? Well, some of those, um, this is a article that was very helpful uh, from Health and Human Services. Uh, when we were starting to do these forums, I contacted the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid, talked with them at length. They came in too and also did some presentations. Department of Commerce also came here. So that was really an engaging period. But here's some of the ones that we talked about. Um, assure, insurers cannot cancel your coverage if you become sick because of unintentional mistake on an application. Now I have asthma. And I remember uh, about four insurance carriers ago, I made a mistake on a medication and put down one that I did not take. And so they came back and denied me the insurance. So if I don't take that one little pill and that uh, puffer when I'm bicycling or if I'm playing basketball, then I'm, it's very difficult for you to breathe. It's just like hands squeezing your lungs that you can't breathe at all. Insurance cannot cap the dollar amount they will pay in the healthcare for a person over a lifetime. Um, I was also in the market when our family was much younger when um, we had had insurance and then the premiums were so, they went up over $400 one year. So it went from $300 and it went up to $900 a month. And so as my wife and I, we sat down and looked and we looked at our two children, Chanel and Mitchell, we said, no way we can pay this. So we went on the market and got a family package. Um, that was uh, much more affordable, but they had a cap. They said how much they would spend. So we wanted to make sure we stayed as healthy as possible that year. Uh, third one, if insurance deny care or payment for services, consumers and new health plans will have a new appeal process. States have new resources to review large rate increases and crack down on premium hikes. Um, there was a comment earlier about very, very large salaries for healthcare executives. And when I worked at a hospital, um, that was a major concern. As a matter of fact, there were uh, several, um, I would say not boycotts, but just people just came from all over and surrounded our hospital and made the chant that you must reduce your salaries. Now I was saying to myself, I'm not making enough as it is. I don't want them to reduce <laughs> mine. But that is the, the uh, persona, persona perception when you're working in a healthcare provider or insurance field. 
And then, of course, starting in 2014, women will no longer be charged higher rates by insurance companies due to gender or health status. Our wife's insurance policy, hers was much higher than mine, but it didn't make any sense at all. Both of us were healthy. So those were some of the ins uh, insurance abuses. Okay. And then you talked about creating jobs. And Bill Tindall, you said you've already begun to ramp up, mm -hmm. anticipating a, uh, a rush of uh, new mm -hmm. enrollees mm -hmm. uh, for the Southside Medical Services. Mm -hmm. And I think that's a wonderful thing that you can expect to be able to deliver more services to more people. And if that means business, but it also means creating jobs. Mm -hmm. I've often said that one of the challenges of our community is that we uh, be able to organize ourselves to benefit from the revenue streams associated with solving problems. Mm -hmm. In the past, it seemed to me, as often as not, uh, and this is a, a kind of a, an Al McFarland statement, mm -hmm. you know, they get the money, we get the misery. Mm -hmm. They make money off of our misery. The disparities reflect the presence of a lot of misery in our community. And the question is, uh, can you look at that just as misery and, and walk away, or can you and should you look at it as an opportunity to provide healing, to provide deliverance, to provide improvement in the lives of individuals and in the lives of families and community. I think we have to say that where there is misery, that's not a static and permanent condition. It's an opportunity f to engage our best minds, our best energy, and our best desires to develop human beings. And so we have plenty of opportunity, but in the past, Stella, Stella, Stella Whitney West, I've said too often, uh, they make a lot of money on our misery. We have to figure out how we put ourselves in the problem-solving side of the equation so that we become the deliverers of the service and that we are paid for that in a way that's reflective of market uh, and of the value of the service that we're providing. What do you think? How do we use this opportunity to make sure that we get our share of the money we need to serve our people uh, effectively and to grow uh, our capacity to end misery in our community. Stella Whitney West, what do you think? Well, um, I mean, you're, you're, you're definitely right on. I've, I've been saying um, all along since I've uh, been in the healthcare uh, industry and tried to encourage and recruit others is that it is, it is definitely and has always been um, a, 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 an industry where there was um, plenty of jobs in an industry that um, has a lot of money and still has uh, a lot of money and so a lot of opportunity. I think certainly what President Obama has done with the Affordable Care Act is to help to begin to level the playing field. And I say begin to level the playing field because um, those of us that watched the, uh, the struggle that he went through to get this um, passed uh, know that it was met with a lot of opposition. And when you think about health care, why would anyone oppose having health care available to all citizens? That this is something that should be a basic right of every American, every human being should have a right to health care. Yet you have to think about why would someone be opposed to that? And then, um, as I always say, follow the money. It's because it is big business. And so let's not let this opportunity um, go aside and make sure that we are part of, of the, uh, the solution and make sure that, um, that we are major players and, and we can do that. Um, as uh, Mr. Tendo has already said, uh, he's gearing up um, we certainly are doing the same thing at our center. We're actually looking at partnerships with the Urban League as well for um, health careers and training. There's a significant number of jobs where um, they can't find enough people, but uh, people have to be prepared. You do have to go into the training, and a lot of these jobs do not require four-year college degrees. It requires um, short-term vocational training mm -hmm. where you can get in and you can get in at the ground level. We hire people 
uh, all the time. Community health workers is one. It is an entry level position. Uh, there are certainly opportunities um, to be into training and, and to be uh, in some of those positions. Um, I was telling my staff that I'm looking uh, to hire people that can um, help in our lobbies right now. Our, our lobbies are crowded, and I saw it as an opportunity for intervention. Where So I'm going to be looking for um, some of um, my community folks to be able to come in and talk with people. What a great way of educating people about about the availability of insurance through the health exchange while they're sitting in the waiting room, waiting for their appointment, having a conversation with them. So I think that those of us that are in leadership positions, uh, we also have a, not only an opportunity but a responsibility to make sure that there is um, openings um, for uh, the community. I think too that uh, we also have a responsibility of um, not only uh, making sure that Minnesota um, is accountable and to make sure that uh, the, the spirit uh, that is in this health exchange is, is certainly one that um, goes forward. Um, I, I think April, and I got to know her uh, when I was on the task force, I think she comes with uh, not only a lot of knowledge and skill, but I think she comes with a lot of passion. Uh, for this work, and that makes a lot of difference. So I don't believe that uh, she left a good job at, at United Healthcare, which is a big uh, player in the health industry, to become a public servant because she's concerned about money. Uh, you don't make that kind of transition if you're concerned about money. And so uh, I believe that uh, that she is a woman of her word, and that she wants this health exchange to to be uh, available and accessible um, for, for everyone. So there is definitely opportunity. So, so April, when you hear an Alan McFarland raise the kinds of questions I'm raising, I raise the question of equity, of parity, of engagement, of inclusion. I, as a citizen, as a taxpayer, as a resident, as a business owner, want to uh, turn to the exchange and to all of state government, to city government, county government, and say, look, uh, I pay taxes here, and I demand, I expect uh, a fair opportunity to be involved in the process of delivering value, goods, and services. The businesses, the, um, the services that my family need, uh, may need, uh, the opportunities that our community ought to have how do I, do you hear us? And, and how do you respond to that? What can you do to assure a person like Al McFarland and the gazillion others like him around town that we really want to engage you in uh, being a partner in delivering a, a healthier state and community? Well, what I'd say is um, we, we definitely want to be creating all of those partnerships. And I think some of the ones that we have are, are great, and we definitely want to build on a lot of those. Um, we are looking towards developing as many opportunities as we can for, for that. Um, through the task forces, through our in-person assisters, the on-the-ground um, types of mechanisms. But we also want to hear from communities as what would be most helpful for you. I think one example of that is uh, we made final today our, um, our rules for our in-person navigator and broker programs and uh, really took some of the feedback. Explain those. Explain those. So uh, one part of the, um, our federal requirement and of the legislation is that uh, we need to have a program that provides in-person assistance um, for individuals. And we needed to have that done by the end of April. So we had about a month uh, to get those rules out. Uh, there was a 21-day comment period and then a week for us to take in those comments. And uh, we really took those comments into heart, and I think there's a few things in few changes in there um, that people will see that that I hope um, they view as as um, um, as good uh, good reaction to some of the feedback that we got is that um, one is around um, meeting communities where they're at, and so one of the one of the pieces of feedback that we got was that we are going to be providing online training for in-person assisters and navigators and brokers um, to be able to um, provide sus assistance to individuals, and they'll have to pass a competent an online competency test. Uh, we got feedback from a variety of different. Um, communities that they would like to provide that training in person in their communities. And we said, absolutely, you can do that. Um, you can take the content, you can provide that training, you can you can target it to the needs of your communities. Um, and 
you know, th then you just need to pass that test. So we really did um, a lot of that to um, to respond to that. Um, the other thing that um, that you'll see in there as well is that we set up um, the metrics and the compensation um, for those in-person assisters and navigators to reflect a few different things. Um, and one key one is really um, paying for performance and, and paying to reduce health disparities. Um, so we're going to be um, encouraging enrollment and, um, and coverage for populations that um, have struggled to get coverage in the past, and we're going to um, make sure that we have compensation there to, to help accomplish that and be, and be measuring ourselves and making sure that we are hitting those targets that we want to hit. So, uh, Mitchell, what should our community be watching for uh, policy-wise? How would you advise, encourage ordinary people in our neighborhood to pay attention Stella said, follow the money. That's always good advice. But what does that mean uh, in terms of us having the knowledge to raise the right questions to get the right answers that we need? Well, certainly the uh, policy and the law has already been written. Um, that, is, that takes a lot of time and effort and watching and listening. And, and, uh, but the good thing now, I would say where we want to focus now is October 1 is right around the corner. It's less mm -hmm. than five months away. That's going to be the open enrollment period. Mm -hmm. um, and so our, our community, our families, our children, um, from faith-based to community-based organizations to the family kitchen, um, when we go out for meals, thus a time now for us to start to talk about this. Now there's, I know, um, Al, in the Insight News, there's been some great articles in there. That is a great place to start. Just take one of those articles and sit around the table and just go through it. Mm -hmm. um, we will, Urban League will be having more forums um, as we continue to watch and observe and see what the pace is. Um, <clears throat> I suppose uh, the other piece, follow the money, is always a good thing uh, because there is tremendous amount of resources in healthcare. Mm -hmm. um, not in many times, and I'm going to want to touch on something else sure. because we talked about jobs before, mm -hmm. and I want to make a parallel. Um, there's jobs at Minshore that's going to be opening up. Um, there's good jobs now, and for those who look at watch watch the website and watch the state uh, job uh, board, but there's good jobs that are going to be opening up that are at Minshore, and they pay well. One thing that I hope that Minshur will do, I want to acknowledge the presence of the owners of the Minnesota Spokesman Recorder here in the audience today, Norma Jean Williams, but uh, the Spokesman Recorder and Insight News are legacy media players in this market, and I'm hopeful that uh, what you're talking about is encouraging uh, Minshur to engage resources like ours mm -hmm. to deliver the opportunity for work uh, to our community. So, so go ahead. The, um the other thing is we all have our children and other friends who are students, and they're going to school for doctors, physician assistants, nurse practitioners, oral and behavioral mental health specialists. Those, they're also educational supports. Now that means there's just going to be able to repay some of those educational loans and so forth at a larger degree than what it is presently. So we want to keep that in mind as well. And then the career training. Um, grants to community colleges and other education institutions, workforce investment boards, um, the short is called WIA, that is also going to be a tremendous area that we're going to still see more growth in. So those jobs are going to be real. And there's not only jobs to be nurses and physicians, there's the whole business side of health care that also we want to keep an eye on and also encourage our young people and others who are changing careers to start to look at. So that would be a start. Mitchell, thank you so much. I want to thank all of you for being here. I want to close with one, one idea. I've uh, recently personally uh, embarked on a personal health and fitness mission for Al McFarland. And in the process, I read about this concept called Blue Zones. And so I'm wondering, what would it take to make North Minneapolis and South Minneapolis, Bill Tendall, <laughs> and Summit University area, these are the areas that have the highest impact of health disparities, right? Uh, the worst numbers in the marketplace. To me, again, that's opportunity. So how do we look at this as an opportunity to convert our neighborhoods, our families, into a blue zone experience? I'll leave that out there as a thought. And maybe we can put our heads together and talk to April and other policymakers about engaging and creating a public mind, a public identity 
in which we see ourselves as the healthiest people on the planet. How do we get from here to there? It can be done. I'm Al McFarland. This is Conversations with Al McFarland. I want to thank my guest, Stella Whitney West, CEO of North Point Health and Wellness, Mitchell Davis, uh, section director, uh, intersection director for the Minneapolis Urban League. Uh, my guest, April Todd Momlove, the new executive director of Minsure, and our guest, Bill Tendall, the uh, CEO of Southside Medical. I thank all of you for being here. I thank you all for listening. Uh, stay with us and let's watch this important conversation. Our health is our business. We have to make it so. Thank you so much. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. We got to say good night. We want to thank Alan McFarland for bringing us all those great words and all our lovely guests, all the guests in the house. Everything's good, you know. So I want y'all to tune in every Tuesday morning, right around 9 o'clock. Because we're going to play a song. All the guests will be home. We'll be feeling like talking. Have a robust conversation. Because it's 